On the 3rd of March, 1962, the commander of Joint Task Force 8 was directed by the Joint Chiefs of Staff to begin preparations for the fleet operational test of the Polaris weapon system equipped with a nuclear warhead. This test was to be conducted in coordination with the AEC and CNO during the 1962 nuclear test series in the Pacific. Major General Alfred Starbird was commander of Joint Task Force 8. The Polaris test assignment demanded the finest kind of teamwork to achieve the required results within the short preparation time available. Participants, civilian and military, were drawn from widely dispersed sources, some 6,200 men of varied skills and talents. Yet less than two months after the JCS orders were received, the Polaris Fleet Ballistic Missile Submarine Ethan Allen, assigned as the launching ship, was being readied for sea at Charleston, South Carolina. She was fully combat loaded with 16 service Polaris missiles. Four of these had been modified as a peacetime safety feature of the test by the addition of a tracking beacon and a destruct system. However, these changes in no way modified the combat capability of the missiles or of the submarine. In a few days, Ethan Allen passed through the Panama Canal, after which he would make a high-speed submerged transit to the rendezvous point in the Pacific. In the meantime, sailing from Long Beach was the carrier Yorktown with Air Group 55 and Destroyer Division 232, Maddox, Brush, Samuel N. Moore, and Preston. From Port Wainimi came Norton Sound. She was to serve as both the flagship of the Polaris launch group and as range safety ship. From the submarine base at Pearl Harbor, Medrigal and Carbonero, assigned to stations in the predicted impact area and fitted with special equipment for burst observation and photography. Operational units of the task force already in the Christmas Island area were also raided for the parts they would play. Ships and task force aircraft maintained constant surveillance of the impact area for safety and security, weather predictions, airborne photography, and other contributing tasks. On Christmas Island itself, 1,200 miles south of Hawaii, two degrees above the equator, there was constant and increasing activity. In the Joint Operations Communication Area, planning and preparation had been going on at an urgent pace for weeks. This was an integrated task force effort. On May 2nd, just under two months after the orders to go ahead with the test, the Polaris Launch Group, designated Task Group 8.8, .8, rendezvoused at the launch point. This was a spot some 1,300 miles from the nearest land in any direction. At this distance, it was impossible for an accident to cause nuclear danger to any inhabited area. Rear Admiral Muston, the task group commander, held a series of conferences in the launch area to coordinate final details. This meeting is in the Ethan Allen, submerged and hovering in launch position while other units take station around her. Out of these rehearsals came the final precise timing and coordination required by the special peacetime safety features of this nuclear missile launch. One of the most demanding test features was that of missile tracking for range safety. Tracking was accomplished by an installation specially provided in Norton Sound for this test. Because of the sensitive nature of this equipment, a careful shaking down was required. Search and surveillance operations from Christmas Island to keep the downrange area clear of ships and aircraft intensified as shot time drew near. The 525 miles from Christmas to the impact point assured the safety of the island's inhabitants, but increased the demands made on the aircraft and crews of both the surveillance and sampler squadrons. On 6 May 1962, everything was in readiness. All ships of the launching group were on station. In the launching area were Ethan Allen, Norton Sound, Yorktown, Preston, Maddox, and Brush. 
Yorktown surveillance aircraft covered the launching area for 350 miles downrange, where the destroyer Samuel N. Moore was stationed. Weather conditions on the day of the test were favorable. Well in advance of the launch, burst observation and sampler units from Christmas Island were ready and in communication with the launching group. Ethan Allen submerged to firing depth. As all hands waited for the task force commander's clearance to fire, the missile control center and Ethan Allen symbolized the tense anticipation of the entire team. And there it goes, Polaris on the way with a nuclear warhead. As the missile rose to its apogee and hurtled on course toward the target point, its contrails were twisted by wind shear in the upper atmosphere. Ten hundred and twenty miles downrange, Carbonero and Medrigal picked up the countdown as the missile followed its plotted path toward the predicted impact point. Right on the second, the missile detonated at the intended altitude at the target point. Inside Carbonero, a periscope camera was rigged to record the burst and cloud effects. This was the view of the detonation captured by a special topside camera that was mounted on Carbonero's periscope. Now here's another view of the cloud that developed. This is a shot through Carbonero's periscope, which had been pre-aligned on the exact point of impact. One hundred eighteen miles from surface zero, the Sutherland's bow was aimed directly at the burst point, giving the photographer a perfect exposure of the fireball. Air Force sampler aircraft of Joint Task Force 8 had taken off earlier from Christmas Island to collect samples from the cloud for determination of warhead yield. These samplers were vectored into selected portions of the cloud by a task force civilian scientist flying in another aircraft at the altitude of the cloud. On landing again at Christmas Island, the sampler crews were taken from the planes by waiting RADSAFE officers and were transported immediately to the decontamination center. The particulate and gaseous samples were removed from the aircraft to be flown directly to the laboratories for analysis. The achievement of the sampler squadron was outstanding when it is realized that the aircraft had to be flown 525 miles each way in gathering their vital data. System accuracy was not considered a part of this test because of inadequate knowledge of geodetics in the test area. However, the available data indicated that the Polaris was on target within the established system standards. The operational test of the Polaris weapons system with a nuclear warhead was completely successful, including proof that the warhead had delivered its designed yield in its full service environment.